Today's podcast is brought to you in part by Real Marketing, the only marketing firm recommended exclusively by the Institute. Real Marketing utilizes over 25 years of expertise, and their products are built and customized for you to dominate any neighborhood, anywhere. Go to realmarketingforyou.com. That's real marketing, the number four, you.com. Also, look for past A State of Mind episodes with CEO David Collins as our guest. Welcome, Jack. We're glad to have you back with us today. Hi, Jamie. Great to see you, too. Always, always. So, Jack, when you and I were chatting and getting ready for the podcast, you mentioned that as markets are softening in uh, in many cases, that there's a little bit more anxiety and uh, the need for really trying to produce showings and uh, and hopefully contracts is maybe making uh, realtors lose down a little bit on their guard on on really qualifying prospects. Uh, tell me what that brought that to mind for you and what you're seeing. Well, I think, first of all, most of what we're hearing in the media, whether it be you know, social media or on television broadcasts or whatnot, anything about the economy, about the economy when it comes to real estate is talking about the, the drastic drops in sales. Um, and so just hearing those terms thrown around like that, makes folks nervous. It makes sellers nervous. It makes agents anxious, particularly agents who haven't been in the business for a very long time. Um, and I want to start with a bit of good news before we talk about how to handle the, you know, the, the anxiety piece. Here's the good news. I mean, y- yes, the market has dropped nationally. I think the number is somewhere around 34% um, from 2021. But if you look at 2021 in the context, historical context, um, it's an outlier. You know, it, it was a year like no other. And so if you pull that year out and look at the last, you know, seven to 10 years of real estate, really this past year is off maybe about two and a half percent nationally. And that varies according to market. So the good news is the market has softened a little bit, but it's not softened nearly as much as one might think by watching the news. I um, totally agree. Yeah. You know, so that said, but, but there's still this angst, if you will, I think, because it's so drastically different today than it was even six or nine months ago. So that's what really what we're dealing with is this, is this shift and the anxiety that comes along with that. So, yeah, I think the reason we need to talk about it is because, you know, when, you, when I sit down and talk with sellers, they're nervous. They're anxious of what to expect. Uh, what is it really like now? And, and what kind of timing are we talking about? It's no longer a conversation about days. It's more of a conversation about weeks and months which is, you know, typical real estate. But I think agents, and again, we've had a lot in our market, we've had a lot of agents who aren't necessarily all that experienced have had the opportunity to market some really nice luxury listings um, because the market was so fluid and so hot. And, and they're getting nervous because they've not worked in really a normal market for any great length of time. So yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm, finding that as well as I'm bringing uh, listings onto the market of trying to counsel sellers on what to expect when when we really don't know either, right? So we can we can talk about the historic uh, perspective. We can talk about the, the difference between what they could have expected six months ago, 12 months ago, uh, and really just kind of prepare them for anything to happen. Because I think still in, in my market in particular, we still have a shortage of inventory, particularly good inventory. So things are going quickly, but they're maybe not going to see full price offers, certainly not 12 offers above list immediately. So uh, I think you're right that that, that seller anxiety is, uh, is really important. Yeah, I think one of the things that contributes to the agent anxiety is that, you know, on any given, any given day, as you go through the email, I find myself hitting the delete button, you know, 100 times, 150 times, all the promotional emails that come through after we review. And so many of them that we see today have the headline, new price, price adjustment, right? These, that sort of terminology, and you see that over and over and over again. And yeah, it causes a bit of anxiety. Um, And I think with that comes the pressure on listing agents to perform and 
in some cases is because sellers have seen up until the last six or eight months so much information about things selling at list, above list, selling quickly, multiple offers. And I think some agents have gone into listing appointments, perhaps promoting their uh, business plan based on a year ago and not based on today. And so they, yeah. they win the prize until they've got the listing, they suddenly find themselves, now they've got this pressure to perform. And I think where that, with how that translates is, um, if we're not, if the phone's not ringing, if we're not getting the calls in the first few days, um, we've got to generate a showing. We've got to generate a buyer. We've got to show that there's some interest out there. And so the first little uh, temptation that we had, the first bait that we see as agents, as a buyer who's calling on the listing, are we, are we doing our proper due diligence for our clients when we get those buyer calls? What, what do you do, Tammy? Like when you, when you get a phone call from, first of all, if you get a phone call from a buyer who's unrepresented um, and they said they want to see a, you know, a three or $4 million listing, how do you handle that? What types of questions do you ask? Well, um, definitely I make clear that, that in order to even secure the appointment, we're likely going to have to produce verification of assets, right? And it's so interesting that we had planned to talk about this because not an hour ago, I got a phone call from a new buyer prospect. Now, this one uh, happened to come as a referral from someone who has sent me a number of very well-qualified uh, buyers over the years. So I have kind of a, a sense that they are uh, quite real and quite uh, qualified, but the property that they asked to see is over $9 million. And in my market, that is, um, well, I'll just say insane. And, uh, and so honestly, it was about all that I could do to keep from, you know, from choking when I was on the phone with him, but, you know, regained my composure. And, uh, and, and I said, uh, certainly, as you might expect, in this price range, uh, we'll be asked to provide verification of assets ahead of time. And of course, that's just something as simple as a letter from your financial advisor or private banker, just stating that, uh, that you have sufficient assets on account. You know, there's no personal information. There's nothing that is intrusive, uh, just a basic letter. And he said, oh, okay, that's great. I can get that done this afternoon. Right? And that, to me, is the key because the folks that are the most qualified are the ones that understand that concept and that have no problem producing that kind of verification. And, and so, to me, it was just like a, a routine exercise. And the more that you... The more that you do that, the more comfortable you get asking. Because I think going back to some realtors who maybe haven't been in the market terribly long or who haven't been in a more normal marketplace, they're kind of nervous to ask those questions, yeah. right? It's a little intimidating. How do you handle it? Well, the same. And it's interesting because I think the, buy, the, the buyer who truly has the wealth and the portfolio and the wherewithal to make that type of purchase, they're not going to be offended by asking that question. Yeah. Um, and and I think agents need to understand that. It's, it's, uh, and if for some reason you do talk to the buyer and they do seem put off because you've asked for proof of funds, the first thing I share with them is, well, if I were listing your home, wouldn't you want me to uh, ask for proof of funds before sure. a stranger off of the street and through your front door? Uh, yeah. It's just a good protocol. And people, people understand that. And so that's actually a red flag. If someone gets mad or upset mm -hmm. or asked, you know, put out because you've asked for that, um, that really should be a red flag in most cases. Now, there are, there are exceptions. I mean, I think if you've got, if you have a buyer who is a very high profile celebrity or an athlete um, or a high profile business person, they're the CEO of a, of a large firm and you can Google and you recognize them and, you, and there's enough information to get together, perhaps that's not necessary. And that might be the person who might be a little put out by that. Uh, but the way that, and I know for myself, the way that I handle it, if I find that I feel like I'm in any way treading on thin eyes, which is rare, but if I feel like I've hit a nerve in any way with that buyer by, by broaching that subject, I quickly put it on the seller and say, I, I, I'm so sorry, but our sellers have requested that we provide this information prior to showing the property to any buyer. And so suddenly it's not about them, it's about any buyer. Um, sure. 
Uh, so that, that helps get it off of you is, is to put it on the seller because the seller is the person behind the curtain. It's the person. Yeah. Behind. Yeah. And then it helps. Why, why is it so important, right? What, what would the, the real ramification be, even if it wasn't somebody who was totally qualified, right? I know it would be wasting our time and wasting yeah. the sellers, but there's some other things at play, aren't there, when we, when we talk about really high-end listings? Well, yeah, absolutely. There's, I mean, there's, there's the obvious things, you know, from time to time we're reminded and we need to be reminded, particularly in markets like this, that, you know, everybody who, who calls on a property is not a buyer and they, they might be even somebody who wants to be a buyer. I, you know, we talk about aspirational pricing. I think there's aspirational buyers, people who would love to be able to, to uh, purchase that property and they may have wealth, but the guy that calls about the, you know, the $9 million listing uh, may be able to buy a $4 million listing. Clearly, this is somebody of wealth. That doesn't mean he can buy the $9 million listing. So we have aspirational buyers. Um, but beyond that, there's a safety piece. There yeah. are people out there, and it's not common, but it happens. We read about it frequently, you know, where there's actual criminals, you know, that, that um, are trying to get into homes like this, whether it's uh, theft or whether it's bodily harm or who knows what. You have to take safety precautions. So it's very important that we know who we're walking into a home with because in many cases we're walking into a home with strangers. Um, When they come by personal referral, obviously it kind of peels that layer away. But when they call off on the phone or they shoot you with a text or they say, do you mind if we speak over WhatsApp? (laughs) That's clearly, that's not, that's not our buyer. Now I will I will disagree because I've got some very high end clients who do enough international travel that they're using WhatsApp. So we don't want to uh, we don't want to instantly rule that out. But the people that just like hedge yeah. about uh, yeah. communicating, I think that's important. And now you mentioned just a minute ago about um, folks that you can look up, right, or that are sure. that are well known. And that you would make the assumption that they were um, in in good shape, but you told me once about a situation where there was a divorce in play that shut down someone's assets. So uh, tell the audience a little bit more about about what that scenario could look like that is different than what you think you might know. Yeah, and that was you know I think the reason that most of us who have been in the business for a long time. You know, the, the knowledge base that we have, probably three quarters of it comes from our mistakes. It's, 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 it's that hard learning experience. This was one of those scenarios. I had a, a gentleman call me. It's probably been uh, 15 years ago, and he, he claimed to be a, uh, a surgeon at Vanderbilt University Hospital. And I quickly recognized him and noted, yeah, he was the surgeon from Vanderbilt University Hospital. And he clearly appeared to have uh, the financial means to make a purchase on the types of homes that we were showing. And he was, uh, had apparently gone through a recent divorce or was going through a divorce. And he was looking at homes with his new girlfriend uh, who has just become his fiance, apparently in the weeks before, as we got close to making an offer and demonstrating proof of funds. Cause I had requested that because mm-hmm. some of the sellers had requested that, um, he hemmed and hawed, as we would say here, and ultimately could not produce proof of funds because his soon-to-be ex-wife, had her attorney, had locked down all of his assets. He could not. He had the bank accounts, but he couldn't access them. And so I think it's important to know what's going on in somebody's uh, life when we're showing them property because they may have the well, but doesn't mean they have the access to the well. And that story can change, too, after the divorce is over. It can completely change what that landscape looks like. Yeah, and even it makes me think about working with uh, working with folks that uh, you have to remind them not to go make a, a big luxury purchase while they're in the process. I had a client once, a successful uh, physician, who called me one day and he said, "Tammy, uh, I know you told me not to make any any you know rash purchases." He said, "But." I just became the owner of a luxury yacht. And I was like, oh my gosh, what did you do? And he said, well, it's kind of weird. I've, I've inherited it. So I didn't actually spend any money on it, but I own it now. Is that okay? <laughs> so that was a unique situation, but, uh, but definitely the kind that illustrates that things can change in, in an instant 
um, for anybody, even wealthy, successful people. So uh, it's, it's part of our responsibility to be diligent about that. Um, yeah, well, there's the other, the, I think the other, uh, the other type of wealth that we deal with is the instant wealth. Um, people who um, have just won some sort of major lawsuit, for example, um, it's, it's, it's almost akin to a lottery winner. You know, suddenly they've gone from one level of living, one lifestyle to suddenly a, a much greater potential. Um, they have greater income and, and greater opportunities. And we've had several calls like that through the years. We had, uh, and this is interesting too, we had a lady call one time that there was a lawsuit and she had several million dollars. She said that she was the beneficiary of, and she gave me the name of her attorney and because I had requested that. That was the proof of funds, you know, the paper trail. Let me talk to the attorney who represents you in the case. And, and so I contacted the law firm. As it turns out, everything she said was true. She, there was a lawsuit. She, uh, they did win the suit. She did. There was a settlement of several million dollars. What she didn't understand, though, is that the several million dollars was all going to her. And the attorney said, she, I don't think she understands what portion of that is hers. And the portion that was hers was not nearly large enough um, to be considered proof of funds for the type of property she was looking for. And so that was a bit of a education piece for her, but also for me, because, you know, we need to understand that some people aren't, don't have ill will when they're misrepresenting right. their, their, their wealth. They don't, they don't understand. That's the instant will. Another example of that would be, I know for our market, we're in the, we're in Nashville, the music industry. Um, and so you got music centers like Nashville, Miami, New York, San Francisco, uh, Austin, LA. Uh, of course. Um, and so with major recording artists, um, it's like athletes. They suddenly have this flow of income. But you really need to understand the uh, their wealth from their business manager's perspective because oftentimes they don't understand what their true purchasing capability is. And so we try to figure out who is the business manager and try to create that relationship. By the way, business manager business managers are terrific folks to have in your hip pocket because if you meet a business manager through a professional athlete or through an artist, um, they're not just managing that artist or that athlete. They usually have a portfolio of folks they're working with, and so if you perform well, then you have the opportunity to work with some of their other clients. But um, but yeah, so we've dealt with that too. We got um, just just as we have worked with major artists who were very capable and made purchases. We've also gotten calls, and I think I shared this with you one time, Tammy. You did. Yeah. I had a, I had a uh, gentleman call me who, um, I, when I asked for proof of funds, he said, well, I'm in the music industry, and he said, um, I've got a record deal. I said, terrific. I said, what's the name of your record label? Which record label are you with? And it, it wasn't one of the major record labels. And I said, well, who's the CEO of the label? He said, well, I'm the CEO of the label. <laughs> so, so I said, so you're the, it's your, you're the CEO of your own independent record label. It's your record deal. He said, yes, exactly. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's obviously a conflict of interest there and, and, and there were all sorts of red flags and he wasn't able to purchase. And that's kind of how you flush those things out. Yeah. Now, you know, it makes me think too about the idea that we want to make sure that folks are qualified for all the reasons that we've talked about. Um, but there's a line between what's appropriate for us to know, for us to ask whether we're representing a seller or whether it's a buyer that we're working with or getting to know. Uh, there's a line between what's appropriate and what crosses the line, right? I think you and I both have been in situations where if we were working with a buyer, the, the listing agent is like super aggressive um, directly with the clients. Like, what do you do? Do you have kids? Where do your kids go to school? you know, really, really personal questions. Uh, do you find that happening? Not often, um, but it does, ha does happen occasionally. Um, most of the time, what a seasoned listing broker will say, even a lot of times these are friends of ours. I mean, if you've been in the business long enough, it's typically a lot of the same folks you're dealing with from transaction to or showing to showing. And so the, t the common question that we'll get if I'm the buyer broker in the transaction from the listing broker is something like, well, sh can you uh, share with me a little bit about your folks um, that I might uh, in turn share with a seller? Tell me about them. And that's not a threatening question. That's totally appropriate to ask. And that puts the burden on me as the buyer agent um, as to what I'm willing to share. 
And so I might say, for example, oh, it's a wonderful family. They're moving here from Omaha, Nebraska, and he's the CEO of such and such firm. And you know, they've got some kids in private school or blah, blah, blah. And I'm just sharing information, the information that my clients um, are comfortable sharing. Right. So it depends on what our relationship is and what they want the world to know. And in some cases, they may be, like we discussed earlier, maybe a celebrity client, and they may not want much information to share you know, for that reason. Yeah, but, discretion can really come into play in that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's a very non-threatening way to, to, to and, a, and a very appropriate way to ask about who the buyer is. What's not appropriate is what happened to me about uh, six weeks ago. I had an agent. It was a listing agent and fairly experienced. I mean, she's been around for a few years. And um, when I called to schedule the appointment, she said, Ed, so um, tell me about your folks. And I was tar- starting to tell her about them before I got to that part. She f- continued with the sentence. And she said, tell me about your folks. Um, are they married? Do they have children? And I said, well, uh, yeah, it's a married couple. Well, do they have kids? How many kids do they have? And she, and she went down this path. And I just stopped and I said, you realize you, you can't ask these questions, right? And she, she paused. She said, well, it's a seller. The seller wants to know. I said, I understand that. I said, but there's certain things that we can and, and, and can't ask. I said, you can ask all about the financial qualifications of the buyer, but you can't really talk about you know, it's okay if I want to share that or my clients want to share that. But as a, as a listing broker, you can't demand, you know, the, to know the familiar status. Yeah, we, we float over the line on fair housing there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but let's talk about that seller who asks us to find out all that information. We talked about setting expectations on uh, what to expect for showing activity in, in a changing market. But what about trying to set expectations uh, with a seller about what's appropriate to ask and what's not, especially if they're if they're pushing you. Well, I think we have to. I think we have an obligation to share with our sellers what our responsibilities are and what we can and can't do. I've told sellers before, hey, if you know if if we're showing your property, you have to be walking through the neighborhood. You can see who walks in the home. We'll do the financial qualification. You're welcome to observe who comes in your driveway, who walks through the front door. Most of our clients these days have some sort of ring camera or some device similar to that. They can, they can see who walks to the door. Um, but we, you know, the information that we observe that way, that's fine. The information that the, that the buyers or their representative shares, that's fine. But you really can't ask those kind of questions. It's, yeah. It's not comfortable. It's not appropriate. Yeah. You know, yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. And, and that's one of the things that, that's really important. And, and I think it's going to be a distinguishing factor between those, those realtors that have, um, have joined the industry just in the last couple of years and, uh, and those that are more seasoned in terms of, you know, the, the, the finesse with which we um, manage our clients and, uh, and interact with each other. And uh, I think it's going to get a little harder and that's going to be surprising for some folks. And the, the nuances that come into play, especially in the upper tier, I think are going to be a little surprising when it, when it takes time and talent to sell things. Tell me about that. What do you mean hard or why? Well, meaning that it's going to take a little longer. We're going to have to have ongoing conversations with our sellers, right? Of a, so here's what we've done and here's, here's what to expect. And, um, and, and so it's, it's just going to, take a little more expertise. We're going to have to work harder at marketing. We're going to have to work harder at uh, good old fashioned picking up the phone and calling other real estate professionals that we know to, uh, to just kind of yank the chain a little bit and, and make sure that our listings are top of mind. Um, and, and so it's not going to be like it has been in the last year, two years of uh, put it in the MLS really? and wait for the offers to come in. Right. So um, that, that's what I mean by that and for sure. Well, I think, I think there's an opportunity here also, Tammy, for us to modify our listing presentations. I think one of the things, particularly again, for the newer agents who haven't been in the market very long, um, one of the things that I always include in a marketing presentation for a seller, in addition to what we do to market the property, how to get people into the property, is conversely how to make sure we keep people out of the property who yeah. should be there. Yeah. We talk about that process of how we pre-qualify 
buyers, what that conversation looks like. And I, in that conversation, I talk with my clients about the types of things that we can and can't ask and how we ascertain their uh, ability to purchase, you know, how we determine their wealth and who, which players can we talk to and to give my sellers a comfort level that it's not just about pushing people through the door, but getting qualified people. Yeah. Door. And, that's, and that, that, I think that gives them a, a comfort level because, yes, obviously they want to sell the home. That's why I'm there. But on top of selling the home, they also want to protect their home. Um, and so there are certain things, for example, I know it's not as common now. But for a while, there was this real push for these 360-degree tours where they would take a, a camera, like a movie-style camera, into a home mm-hmm. and, and tour each room, every door. And, it was it. and um, early on, I started getting questions. I realized that was making some of our clients uncomfortable. And I, and, I under, and I understood, and I agree. So we, we, didn't, we never really used that technology very long because uh, we realized that some sellers feel like that was an intrusion on their privacy yeah. uh, and their safety. You know, yep. showing where doors were and exits and windows, and you could see which room as were which kids. And there's all sorts of things, you know, ramifications. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think, yeah. I think you know, the sellers of comfort level is, is a big part of the overall presentation that on the back end, serves us well so that when you don't have large numbers of people showing the property, we can talk about the people we haven't shown the property to. Yeah. Well. Now, I want to circle us back just a minute because I don't want anybody to have the impression that I'm not supportive of, um, of our colleagues who are newer to the business. In fact, I think both you and I, Jack, spend so much time mentoring and teaching and training sure. that what we want to do is provide the resources for those who are newer to the industry to learn what it is that they don't know yet uh, and to be tomorrow's superstars and successful folks. And so let's talk for uh, just a quick minute as, uh, as our time is passing. What are some resources that real estate professionals can use to qualify buyers, right? So you've talked about Googling them. Uh, you also teach a class, don't you, that is uh, in, open in your market to any brokerage? Tell me about that real quick. Yeah, and we're actually due to do one of those again soon. Every few years, we do a class called the Million Dollar Disappointment, um, how to flush out scam artists in the luxury home market. And basically, we open it to agents from all different companies to come. And every time we've done it, it's been a full house, standing room only. It's a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, I don't necessarily teach the class. What I do is serve as a moderator. Right. I, I invite some of the top producing luxury agents and brokers in our market to sit on a panel and we have a we have a very conversational uh presentation like you and i are doing right now but instead of two of us there's probably you know seven of us and we're talking about some of these same topics about how you qualify buyers what kinds of questions you can ask and they share stories the agents share stories um success stories and also some screw-up stories you know what have we done that we learned from that we that we don't want you to do here's what not to and um, yeah, it's very important that we that we um, provide training to our new agents in the business. We want to welcome new blood, and we want to train and help mentor. And that's that's always been something I've enjoyed tremendously. But yeah, that, it's a tremendous presentation, and it what it does is it gives agents the opportunity to ask all the hard questions in an environment where the panel is completely prepared. The answer right the and and it's a safe space you're not you're not it's you know, just trying it out in the field which can be so intimidating and you know in the institute training that i deliver as well as my fellow instructors we spend some solid time talking about the importance of and and some techniques for changing the conversation about uh, qualifying buyers and um, institute members have access to the tool called OWL, the online wealth lookup. So in addition to things like Googling and, and, uh, and, and getting sphere of influence uh, recommendation, they can also drill down a little bit and, uh, and look up individuals to make sure that they have uh, the level of wealth that, they, uh, that they're expressing. Um, so lots of tools, and I would encourage any real estate professional who's listening who feels uncomfortable with that whole qualifying um, aspect to to look for some look for some training, look for some resources, find a mentor, somebody who's been working in the upper tier, um, and get comfortable with that because it it really is super super important. 
So I think that we have covered most of what we wanted to talk about uh, in our time. Um, tell me what you're looking forward to uh, in the in the next several weeks before we get back together again for another another episode. What's uh, what what's your world looking like? Well, one of the things that we've seen this is the most encouraging thing. I shared this in our sales meeting yesterday. Um, uh, my business partner Robert was showing one of our clients' homes earlier this week. I think it was Monday, and he had two appointments back to back. Where as he was heading to the first appointment. He got a call that the house had gone under contract, and as they arrived at the second appointment, he got a, another call from another agent that that house had gone under contract. And so I shared that with our colleagues because I said, as unfortunate as it was for our client, that was the best news I've heard in weeks, is that that's the kind of thing that was happening routinely a year ago. But over the last few months, that hasn't been happening at all. So yep. it feels there's some momentum we feel picking up. It looks like interest rates are coming down a little bit which is nice. Um, uh, we've got a few notifications from lenders, so that'll be, that will certainly help. Any bit of good news in the media always helps, but you can feel the momentum picking up. Some of that, I think, historically, is just, it's just the seasonal. You know, we go through the holidays, everybody put, you know, press the pause button, and they're waiting to get through all of that, and now we're back in business. So that's part of the momentum. But I also feel like that given the fact that we still, even though the market has slowed down, we still don't have enough inventory. Right. There's certainly more inventory than we had you know, six months ago, which is good. We need it. And we know the buyer demand is there. And so it's exciting to see inventory, see choices again. Um, as fun as the ride was in 2021, when there was so much business, it was incredibly frustrating to have clients traveling across the country, come spend three or four days in Nashville. And, and have nothing to show them. And have nothing to show them, yeah. Or, or, or they would have like six or seven homes they've been, watching and so excited about seeing and all of them be gone by the time they arrive. And so, um, so yeah, so it's exciting to have more inventories. That's what we're excited about. What about you? Yeah, What's yeah there? I'm, I'm excited to get back to, to doing what we do, right? The, the, the last couple of years have, everybody's had to pivot in every single way. And I'm, I'm excited. It puts a smile on my face to, uh, to line up an afternoon of showings, right, and uh, and to have some things to to show, and to have buyers and sellers, and you know all of that uh, that juggling act going on, right? We're having to uh, to remind ourselves some of the the basic things, but it just it it makes me happy to be back in the business of helping helping people buy and sell property that's making a difference instead of just striking out and striking out and striking out and striking out. So. Uh, I am very optimistic about uh, about the market and uh, uh, taking all the media reports with a grain of salt. And what I'm seeing is um, is real estate the the way that I've known it for for 20 years with its right. ups and downs. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that now I think we're starting to see. Okay, this is where our skill sets truly come into play. Now we're back to we're marketing properties. We're not just getting photographs of properties in and putting it on the MLS or dropping it into a, uh, you know, a private broker group and waiting for the, all the offers to come in. We're actually marketing properties again. And it's fun and it's, and it's exciting. And the properties will sell and the business will turn. It's the one thing about the business that's for sure. It's not the same all the time. It's right. a moving target. And so I think one of the things that we have to do, and it's, it's an exciting part of our business, is that our business looks different on different days. You know, we don't sit in a cubicle every day with somebody giving us these things to do. Uh, we get to go out in the field, literally. Sometimes we're literally in fields. You know, we get to go out on boats and look at waterfront properties. We get to go out in fields, look at new construction. We have all these different things that happen. And now we're marketing properties again. And now we're showing this is our, our business expertise, how to promote our clients' properties to the world. And as buyer brokers, how to bring the information that we have on our market to the buyer and get the choices to the buyer. Yeah, because we were there was a time there where it was just like just holding by the reins, trying to keep up. Right. Now we're now we're getting ahead of it again, where we can get ahead of it and plan and prepare, which is which is really a nice. It's a nice place to be. I don't have a lot of complaints. Well, it's also a nice place to be for you and I to be doing this podcast together because we're going to get to embrace all of the things that come at us in in real time with uh, with real life perspective. 
And so um, our time is up for this episode. Uh, but I want to thank you, Jack, and I look forward to our, uh, our next podcast together. Me too. It was great. Thank you, Jamie. Excellent. So, listeners, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of A State of Mind, The Art of Selling Luxury Real Estate. If you're interested in learning more about the Institute for Luxury Home Marketing, you can find more at luxuryhomemarketing.com. If you like what you just heard, Please share it with a friend and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Thanks for listening. <music>